Thank you for joining us today in Jennifer Shouston Associates Complimentary Webinar Series. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. today. This year on Fridays, we're covering procurement playbooks. We'll take a deep dive into doing business with the agencies and departments with our panelists. On Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, we will cover the FAR supplements or procurement regulations for the agencies and departments. Fridays, we will cover the business development and marketing aspects of the corresponding agency and department. The full schedule and the sign-up links are on our website. We'll also be hosting a complimentary webinar on what federal contractors need to know about COVID mandates on Thursday, March 17th at 12 p.m. Eastern. The registration link is provided below. And in addition, we will be hosting our spring networking event on Monday, March 28th from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. And again, the registration link is included below. We would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Virginia PTAC at GNU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you are interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTACs can offer. And a special thanks to our sponsor, the Federal Business Council. The FDC creates and manages virtual and in-person meetings and events to connect appropriate industry and government thought leaders, product providers, and solutions with government programs that use them. The FDC works with mission-specific programs for a variety of agencies to connect government and industry in the form of in-person and virtual conferences, training events, policy dialogue, and outreach. Over the last 40 plus years, FDC has become a comprehensive resource for connecting industry and federal government. And we would also like to thank our friends at C3 Integrated Solutions. C3 is a full service IT provider helping DOD contractors achieve CMM C2.0, DFARS and NIST 800-171 compliance through cloud-based solutions, including Microsoft 365, GCC, and GCC High. You can learn more at info at C3ISIT.com. Today, we are covering doing business with the DLA. Let's meet our panelists. We want to thank our friends from Bedmine, Mrs. Archisa Mahan. Great to have you with us, Archisa. Hi, nice to be here. Uh, my name is Archisha Mihan, and I'm the FedMine Senior Product Manager at um, Gupspend, which, uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here with all of you and um, specifically talking and focusing on the DLA. Thank you, Archisha. And we also want to thank Christopher Hall from DLA for joining us today. Great to have you with us, Chris. Sure thing. Thanks for having DLA. We would also like to thank the McLean Group for providing for joining us and providing an M&A perspective on the movers and takers within the agency. Thank you to Paul for joining us today. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, for having me. Thank you, Paul. And now we will take a look at business opportunities and outlook. Archiza, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so next slide. So good afternoon. Um, uh, you know, FedMine is a federal market intelligence company that is uh, focused on federal spend data. Um, and uh, what we really do is integrate all the various 18 federal data sets into an easy to use platform that actually allows reporting and, and um, analytic uh, analysis ability that was not really available, but previously available. Uh, last summer, we got acquired and are now part of GovSpen, which provides, which is the largest provider of data on the state, local, and education market. So, uh, exciting times for us. Uh, next slide, please. So, today we are focusing on DLA. Um, you know, the Defense Logistics Agency, as we all know, is the nation's um, combat logistics support agency. and is responsible and manages the global defense chain for the five military services, the commands and other federal, state and local agencies and partners. Um, I always like to talk a little bit about an agency, but I know Mr. Hall's on the phone uh, on this uh, today, so I'm gonna let him talk more about all of this. So if we could get into the next slide. Um, I actually love reading, um, you know, the visions, uh, vision statements that most of the agencies have. And I really like the one for DLA where it's talking about, you know, being innovative, adaptable, agile, and accountable, and focused on the way of warfighter always. I think that sort of really helps tell us what the agency's mission is and also where they are moving if we start, you know, reading more about what they're doing. Um, 
you know, and then one of the things, and I have provided the link to the strategic plan, but I think it helps to know what an agency's um, vision is, what it leads into the various line, how it can, gets converted into the lines of effort, which really then leads into how we need to look at an agency, the opportunities, and what is out there. So, you know, just to sort of tell you a little bit about that. So um, I wanted to make sure I also provide you the link to the strategic plan, which actually is really detailed. So, you know, uh, Mr. Hall, kudos to your agency for that. Um, next slide. So let's look at the overall spend that the LA, you know, historical spend. So last fiscal year, so 2021, uh, the agency has spent uh, more than $39 billion to more than 10,000 companies. It is a slight drop from FY20 um, uh, by about a couple of billion dollars. Um, so, you know, historically we've seen the dollar spend fall from FY18, 19. FY20 was one of the largest uh, spend for the federal government. So, um, next slide. Um, Overall, you could see, uh, you know, how the various um, components or commands within uh, the agency have been um, acquiring contracts, awarding contracts, aviation, energy, maritime, all in your top components, and you could actually see the spend. Uh, so again, helps to understand based on what we are, what are, what the company's um, core capabilities are, how that's being. Uh, spent and you know understand more by detail getting into transactional details um, next slide so let's look at your top NAICS codes that are being procured by the federal agency um, you know again you'll see a lot of medical related uh, NAICS codes you'll see some uh, aircraft related NAICS codes, uh, and it sort of ties in when you start looking at your top prime contractors, you see a lot of the medical supply companies, um, again, ties in, so always helps, um, and that's why I'm always trying to provide the top companies and the top NAICS codes and see how, you know, the spend matches with who's winning contracts. Um, so next slide. But let's focus in on the small businesses. Um, the DLA has, um, you know, almost 35% of its spend was as small business contracts. Uh, they spent, uh, awarded $13 billion to more than 8,000 companies, which is amazing. Um, next slide. In terms of the prime contractors, again, we do see Atlantic Diving Supply right up there. But we also see a lot of other smaller companies. Um, and then the other thing that I always like to see and understand is how are the contracts being awarded, especially if I am a socioeconomic, uh, you know, if I have a socioeconomic designation, what contracts are being awarded as sole sources or hub zones or, or as uh, women-owned small businesses. So again, um, important to understand how the agency is procuring and what is it procuring and who's winning those contracts as we understand an agency and think about you know whether just understanding our competitors or start thinking about creating those uh, relationships with the companies that are already within an agency um, next slide this one um, i love looking at psc codes uh, i just find that they give a much better understanding of what an agency is doing um, but just looking at the small business contracts that have been awarded, you could actually see the top NAICS codes that have been used. But have a look at your, um, you know, the PSE codes, and it gives you a much better understanding of what the agency is procuring from the small businesses, whether it's clothing or laboratory equipment or fruits and vegetables. So always, you know, while, while we are so focused on NAICS codes, Take some time and understand the PSC codes too, because I, a lot of times those PSC codes are more in line with what your company is doing. Um, so next slide. 
Um, also, as we are sort of going through the spend and understanding, you know, where the contracts are going, um, let's, with the pandemic, it gets to be even more important to understand what's being awarded, who's winning the contracts, how much is an agency spending under the COVID-19 National Interest Action Code, and FY20, FY21, the agency spent more than $2 billion under this, um, you know, under this NIA code. And so far, also the agency has spent a substantial amount. So again, gets to be important to see what the agency is procuring, who is it procuring from, and sort of helps go in, uh, helps us with our plan to win business and do business with DLA. So next slide. Um, you know, I just said I love PSC codes. Um, the GSA's category management looks at, you know, how spend is across all categories, and this is really based on the PSC codes. And when I look at this chart, I found it super fascinating to see that the top categories uh, look at the percentage that's going to small businesses. And that sort of tells you more about how the agency is purchasing and their commitment to the small businesses. Um, obviously with medical, you know, you have the big farmers and, you know, with the medical supplies, we don't always, uh, you know, this seems to be pretty in line with what we've seen across the federal government. Uh, but also keep looking at category management and spend by small and other than small business to truly get a better understanding of how the agency is purchasing and what maybe you should be focusing on. Um, next slide. The other thing that I love looking at is as part of that, you know, category management and strategic sourcing and uh, understanding how is the agency purchasing across all the various GVACs and IDIQs that are out there. Um, and this is just looking at the top five um, GVACs that the agencies used. Um, again, always, you know, we're seeing more and more of NASA soup being used across so many different agencies. Um, Oasis is definitely up there, the unrestricted tool. Uh, DLA Jets, of course. Um, but last year we saw um, a large amount being awarded under um, the special operations equipment tailored logistics support program. So um, that was, um, you know, nice to see too. Um, next slide. So when we start talking about opportunities, especially from, uh, you know, understanding what we want to add to our pipeline, how do we create our agency plan, things like that. Um, I always, I mean, what we have seen the most successful companies do is, you know, really understanding what are the new opportunities at an agency. And that could be, you know, based on the new initiatives that an agency has, which is why the vision and the mission gets to be super important and getting to understand where is that agency going? What are they doing? How are they purchasing? Um, and it, that truly is also dependent, again, you know, on the agency's need. Um, also, the other thing that we find is really helpful is understanding what are the contracts that are expiring that could be recompeted. Um, and many times, if you know you're, you're in the product, if you're selling products and IT type of equipment and things, I find it super helpful to go back a few years. Uh, you know, if it's if you're selling something like computers, you know, you know this might be a refresh every three to five years. So go back, see what was purchased, who purchased it, things like that. Um, so all of so now where do you get this information? Um, the budget and program information is super helpful. Gives you a lot of information. Um, free solicitations and source of sort notices in SAM.gov again is important. Um, DLA uses dibs, so make sure you're looking at dibs too. And then the other thing that we find is very helpful is creating expiring contract searches based on what you do you know whether we're looking at NAICS codes or uh, pr products or services you know keywords a combination of all of that adding on socioeconomic um, indicators adding on things like uh, 8 day set asides or uh, looking at 8 day set asides and 8 day expiration dates you know for the incumbent 
So many ways of creating these expiring uh, contract searches. And um, I think they get to be very, very helpful as you sort of focusing and understanding, do you want to be focused on a specific agency um, based on what might be coming up, you know? So again, uh, next slide. So I did a quick search for contracts that are expiring as, uh, and I focus specifically on contracts that are expiring as other than small business. Um, we have more than eight, almost $9 billion in mod zero contracts that are expiring that were awarded as other than small business. And again, you could see the various NAICS codes that are being, uh, that the contracts were awarded under lot of manufacturing and aircraft related solutions. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. Next slide. And in top, so keeping in mind those next codes where the contracts were, expi you know, were expiring, no surprises when you look at the top contracts that are expiring. And this was just the mod zero contracts. Um, you know, Boeing, Sikorsky, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, all the th companies that you would expect to see very much part of this uh, pool of contracts that are expiring in the next 12 months. Uh, next slide. So when we start looking at the contracts that are expiring uh, for that were awarded as small business, I have more than $6 billion in contracts that are, uh, that are expiring. And these are again, mod zero contracts. And again, it's uh, nice to see you know, how much of it was actually a small business set aside or, you know, a, an 80 sole source, uh, things like that. And always, always, always good to see an agency actually using the women-owned small business sole source um, criteria. So, yeah. next slide. And now when you start looking at, um, you know, the next codes where the small business um, contracts are, you will see a different mix, which ties in again with, uh, you know, a small business being a small business. Um, also have a look at the top um, companies, Atlantic Diving, uh, part of that whole mix along with, um, you know, supply core and federal resources. So again, ties in with the next codes. Uh, next slide. And here's a list of the top contracts that are expiring that were, that were um, set aside as a uh, small business. So uh, next slide. So the other thing, you know, is um, your searches. So make sure you're following, uh, you know, opportunities, RFPs, respond to source of sort and pre-solicitations. That is super important. Um, we talk with so many agencies where they really wish that more and more companies would respond to them. Uh, but save your searches, follow the opportunities, respond to them, um, you know, get familiar with dibs, especially for DLA. Um, and I actually was, um, I have provided the link to DLA's forecast page too. Uh, they have done a very good job again of making sure that the uh, forecast is made public. So. So this really is a quick overview of DLA and how it has spent in the past and where the possible opportunities could be. Um, again, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is very much part of the presentation. And I will now hand it over to Mr. Hall from DLA. Thank you, Archiza. And now we'll move to an inside, inside perspective from the government. Chris, the floor is yours. Sure, thanks. And you can go ahead and jump to the next chart. Um, so good afternoon, India. Thanks again for having me and having DLA inviting us to your event and certainly spending most of the time thus far talking about DLA. So yeah, so what was just presented there um, from FedMind is a great introduction to what I'll get into. Um, you know, certainly that's all the data uh that, that you can pull you know mostly public well it's all publicly av available data uh you can pull on NAICS codes and pscs and who's you know contractors expiring contracts uh etc and i think i'll be able to give you some good insights into what you know what what that looks like on the on the front end and what dla looks like and you can see the kinds of things we're buying um 
NAICS codes, PSCs don't necessarily always tell the whole story. Um, so I'll get into a little more of the, um, I guess, layman's term way to explain what we're buying, you know, rather than looking at NAICS codes. But certainly that was a great uh, analysis and, and, and a great brief and a good introduction to what DLA buys. Um, and certainly I'd say, um, you know, whenever you're pursuing a new customer, right, a government agency, um, you know, we all get the cold calls from vendors. And, and, and quite frankly, that's not probably the best way to go about pursuing, you know, a big customer, what has the potential to be a big customer like DLA or another federal agency. You really want to learn about what the agency is doing and buying and, and then learn about their requirements and then, you know, shape your proposals shape your strategy around that so yeah definitely a good idea um you know look at the um, dla strategic plan look at our website look at our forecasts and then attend events like this one and other stuff that we do and i'll and i'll show you as we get into this a little bit um our calendar where you can where you can register for additional events that dla puts on so certainly um you know glad everyone's on the line and, and and it's a good idea to learn about dla so we'll get we'll get into it um this chart just showing our website our links to our small business office and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh as we get into it so we can go ahead and jump to the next chart um the acquisition for, forecast again we have a chart later on um we can go ahead and skip this one for now um sba scorecard so right so dla is of course part of the department of defense and and the department of defense being the largest the largest buying agency right across the government something like 65 or something like that percent of all government spend is via dod uh, and dod contracts and of course you have army navy air force are the big three right the military services uh, and then you have various dod components or dod agencies and that's where dla um, comes in. So we are a support agency to Army, Navy, Air Force. We are actually DOD's largest agency outside of the military services. So you kind of have, when you look at small business spend, and if you were to look at the scorecard, um, the scorecard, of course, if you don't know, is based on the goals that SBA sets for the Department of Defense, the DOD-wide goals. Um, and then from there, so DOD or SBA sets a goal for DLA or for DOD, excuse me, SBA sets a goal for DOD, but then DOD sets goals for DOD components like Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, and DLA and the other various uh, DOD agencies. So you won't find DLA data um, called out specifically in the scorecard might be an interesting read, but really that's at the DOD level and we're just a component of that. Uh, fairly large component, but not not quite as large as the uh, the services, Army, you know, Navy, Air Force. So we could jump to the next chart. All right, so um, what is DLA? So you heard you heard a lot about what we all, what we buy already, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of NACE codes, PSCs. Um, and, a, and a good introduction really to, DO, to DLA, where you had to look at our strategic plan, um, our lines of effort within the strategic plan, um, our vision, et cetera, but, but you heard before. So we are the Department of Defense's Logistics Combat Support Agency. We provide worldwide logistics support to the military services, services as well as several civilian agencies in foreign countries. Uh, to put our mission in simpler terms, and you saw some of this data, DLA sources and provides nearly 100% of the consumable items that our military forces need to operate. So by consumable items, I mean we supply the Army, Navy, and Air Force with everything from food, fuel, energy, uh, things like uniforms, medical supplies, uh, pharmaceuticals. You saw that in some of the COVID-19 spend. Um, I think we saw that it was about $2 billion, three years in a row almost, um, a little less than that for FY22, which of course is is, is just about halfway through um, but medical supplies uh, covid testing kits are, are the big item that we're buying um, about a billion dollars or more this year we spent on covid 19 testing kits um, and about a billion dollars of that medical is one of our challenging uh, supply chains you saw if you, if you looked at the list of vendors top do top dla vendors on one of the charts you saw two pharmaceutical companies in the top three uh in addition to atlantic diving supply which operates in our uh, special operational equipment program so we'll talk a little bit more about what atlantic diving supply does for dla or we'll more so talk about the program that they operate uh under um uh, we also supply most of the repair parts for all of dod's trucks ships 
and aircraft. So you saw on the charts before, um, you know, aircraft parts and, and various manufactured parts. I usually say um, DL, DLA writes, uh, the DOD generally, Army, Navy, Air Force, DOD broadly spends about 50% of their contract dollars buying services and 50% of their contract dollars buying supplies. Uh, on the other hand, DLA spends about 95% of our contract dollars, and you saw you know, roughly $40 billion a year, about 95% of that is on supplies, you know, what things like food, fuel, energy, um, energy being I mean, fuel, right, uh, petroleum products, um, and then repair parts for deals, truck ships, and aircraft. So I usually say if your business makes, manufactures, or produces something, you know, pay special attention because those 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 are our primary, or we, we, we have the potential to be your uh, customer certainly um, if you if you if you produce if you make if you manufacture um, or even if you distribute um, the various types of supplies uh, that DOD requires. So DLA supplies about 90% of the military's spare parts, nearly 100% of the fuel, and manages the the reutilization of military equipment. So we're headquartered uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, just south of Washington D.C. But DLA is a global enterprise, and wherever the nation has a significant military presence, DLA is there to support. So we rely on our industry partners to produce virtually everything that we subsequently push out to military services. So that is, we don't, we don't, of course, we don't manufacture, we don't, we don't own a petroleum refinery, we don't make the parts, um, but we acquire these items from manufacturers and suppliers that we then provide to DoD and our other federal customers, often with supplementary services such as warehousing and packaging. DLA also writes contracts for items that are provided directly by our suppliers to DLA customers. And when I say DLA customers, I mean the warfighter soldiers, Army, Navy, Air Force. Those are DLA's customers. Um, we also write contracts for our suppliers to provide material directly to our customers. For example, food and fuel for direct, direct, direct excuse me, delivery to military installations. So um, you saw DLA as a big agency. You saw the vast um, the wide array of, of different kind of contracts we write. Um, DLA processes over 100,000 orders per day from our customers. We write about 10,000 contracts every day. I mentioned that our primary customers are the military services. However, we have a whole of government strategy, which expands our customer base beyond just the DOD. So our customer base includes other agencies, such as the Department of Homeland Security, um, you may know that includes FEMA, uh, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, and the Department of Agriculture. And with that, we can jump to the next chart, please. So the takeaway, so this is DLA contract dollars. You saw it earlier in the in the, in the the charts from FedMine, but a, a little more than $13 billion for FY21. And the takeaway from this chart is that DLA presents a ton of opportunities in a wide array of industries. So on the screen are each of DLA's major supply chains and buying commands, and you can see that most of our subordinate commands individually award contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars or even billions of dollars to small businesses each year. So DLA has met its small business goal for nine consecutive years, and just like the rest of the federal government, we have contracts with women-owned small businesses, small disadvantaged businesses, hub zone small businesses, and service disabled veteran-owned small businesses. And if we jump to chart four, or sorry, not chart four, in my deck it was chart four. Um, so here we'll, here we'll talk a little bit more about each of our major buying commands and our supply chain. So you can see on this chart, we're looking at how DLA is organized to support our customers. So we manage the supply of over 6 million items that we've segmented into eight supply chains major, managed by six major subordinate commands, or MSCs, and are run through each of them uh, quickly. So DLA troop support manages four of DLA's eight supply chains, which are subsistence, clothing and textiles, construction and equipment, and medical supplies. So the troop the support that Troop Support provides, they provide all, nearly all of the supplies a soldier needs. So if you can think of that in terms of food, uniforms, uh, special operational equipment, we mentioned, our FedMine mentioned one of their charts, the Special Operational Equipment Program, and that's the Atlantic Diving Supply Contract. So that's a multiple award contract. It's a set aside 
Um, so Atlantic Diamond Supply is fairly large, as you saw by the dollars, but they are a small business, and that is a multiple award, small business set aside, special operational equipment program. And of course, Atlantic Diving Supply uh, does very well uh, in that program, but there are other small businesses that compete for orders uh, with Atlantic Diving Supply and the other prime contractors uh, that participate in that program. Um, we saw in the charts before, um, and I mentioned DLA works with agencies outside of DLA, or excuse me, outside of DOD. So the work that Troop Support does to support FEMA during natural disasters during the COVID-19 pandemic are a couple of good examples of that. Um, DLA Aviation, their primary mission is to procure repair parts for both fixed and rotary wing aircraft, um, helicopters, airplanes, so they provide all the parts to sustain those systems, you know, for their, you know, throughout their life, which could last, you know, decades. So DLA doesn't buy the jet, doesn't buy the truck or the tank or the ship, but DLA buys all the parts, the repair parts, to sustain those systems over their lifetime. Um, DLA Atlanta Maritime, similar to aviation, but they manage all the repair parts or most of the repair parts for all of DOD's trucks, uh, tanks, land vehicles, um, and ships. So as the name suggests, bottom right of the chart, DLA Energy, they provide energy products to the military services and other federal agencies. Primarily, uh, this is petroleum. You saw, I think, petroleum refineries at the top of one of the lists we looked at before. So they purchase petroleum products, you know, jet fuels, automotive, gasoline, heating oils, diesel fuel, um, and things like that. Um, distribution, towards the bottom left of the chart, distribution, disposition services. So distribution, they manage our distribution centers worldwide. Or worldwide. So while DLA supply chains that we've run through just now buy material, DLA distribution's major mission is to support the Department of Defense by receiving, storing, and issuing material from our warehouses. Um, maybe ironically, DLA buys very little transportation services, you know, trucking, shipping, stuff like that, uh, because that's done by a different DOD agency. Uh, you may know the United States Transportation Command or US Transcom. So DLA distribution doesn't distribute material per se, but they manage DLA's warehouses. And when it comes to shipping, um, trucking, um, things like that, it's either a direct delivery from our suppliers to our customers, or U.S. Transcom uh, often fills in um, and, and, and purchases all, most of the trucking, shipping, and moving material around types of services. Uh, DLA disposition services. So their role is reutilizing or disposing of material no longer required by the DOD. So a big part of their mission is hazardous waste disposal. Uh, and small businesses do really well um, in that in that industry um, and some of those contracts are set aside for small business and some um, of the socioeconomic programs. Um, so I manage that about 95% of DLA contracts are supplies as opposed to services, but DLA distribution and disposition services also buy services to support their missions. Uh, I mentioned um, hazardous waste disposal, also warehousing and maintenance for material handling equipment. So in a nutshell, that's DLA um, in, our, in our buying command. So we can jump to the next chart. Uh, so here's why I wanted to point you to various resources. So on the top left, you see that's our small business home homepage. Uh, you'll find lots of useful information there beyond uh, what we've had a uh, brief time to go through today. Uh, the top right side of the page so that's our outreach calendar you can go here to register for various webinars that we host for the small business community we're usually out there at least at least every month and you'll find on the calendar events or webinars sessions that we're hosting from the headquarters office small business where i work um, and if you can see it it's tiny on the chart you know, we also post on our um calendar there events hosted by our major subordinate commands so the use of course the deal doing business with dla aviation is a dla aviation hosted event down at the bottom um, there the training knowledge opportunities tko we call it seminar is something hosted by dla atlanta maritime um, so you can register for all of these events on our website for starters especially if you're brand new to dla uh, the one i'd recommend you put on the top of your list is the april 13th webinar so this is a general uh, very general doing business with dla type session uh, you'll hear 
uh, probably reiterated some of the stuff we've gone over today, but you also have a chance to hear directly from representatives from each of DLA's major subordinate commands. On the bottom left, you'll find various procurement and demand forecasts uh, that DLA has published, um, but really even better than that, um, on the right side, bottom right side of the page, you see our Contact Us page. We've posted contact information for all of DL DLA small business offices, which are located alongside each of our major buying commands. So as a recommendation, you know, based on the information that I've gone through today, whatever else you have a chance to look at, um, really drill, you really want to drill down. So I'm from the headquarters and I know a little bit about everything, but you really want to drill down to the command that, that you think you can support and where your firm has capabilities. Uh, and you see they're listed there and you'll be able to click on our website on each of those names, Shoop Support Energy Distribution, um, and get right to the folks that sit in the small business office, which is right alongside our buying commands. And those are the folks you really want to talk to um, if you're serious about pursuing DLA as a customer. Um, and with that, I think I'll call it a wrap. And I, again, appreciate the time and a chance to go over um, this with you. Thank you, Chris. And you can find his contact information on the last side of the presentation today. And uh, lastly, we'll move to M&A activities within top contractors. Paul, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And thank you again for having me. So uh, I'm Paul Kleck. I'm a managing director with the McLean Group, uh, experienced about uh, 25 years in the investment banking landscape. And you know, through that, have spent a considerable amount of time in technology, media, and telecom, and you know, over the last number of years, more in, in kind of professional services and government services, uh, you're know, tying into to the contractors in the space. Um, Next slide, please. So uh, who was the McLean Group? The McLean Group is a 25-year-old uh, boutique investment bank. So boutique from the aspect, we're focused on the lower middle market. Uh, you know, we're not the, the 300, 400-person shop that, uh, that you run into or the 1,000-person shop at, off of Wall Street. You know, what we focus on are specific uh, businesses, specific business verticals. Uh, and we work with, again, companies in the lower middle market. Lower middle market can be businesses from, from 10 million in enterprise value to a couple hundred million dollars in enterprise value. It is a, a pretty broad definition, um, but really kind of a targeted area that, that fits in very well to, to this aspect of, of government contracting, but you know, a lot of the government contracting names uh, in particular. Types of services we provide as a firm are, are traditional M&A advisory services. Uh, most of our work is uh, on the M&A side, is sales side advisory work. We also do uh, some advisory work on the buy side, helping companies target and, and build, and then look at various uh, liquidity options for uh, for businesses, which could be divestitures, could be a, a leverage buyout, could be um, you know, working on exit strategy plans, kind of how to build up the business and, and you know, target markets for when to go ahead and have an exit, as well as capital infusion, uh, which could be debt or equity from individuals or strategics. And then the other side of our business is our valuation advisory business. This is a full service valuation team. Uh, it's one of the largest practices on, on the East Coast, working with uh, over 400 clients uh, kind of uh, across industry sectors. You're being tied into the M&A team, being here in Northern Virginia. Uh, they do have a lot of tie into government contracting, but are also pretty broad in looking at other industry sectors. So th those are the services we provide. You know, the, the sectors we really focus on are are four sectors we kind of view as, as interrelated to each other. So defense, government, and intelligence, this is more of the traditional uh, government contracting space uh, that you run into and, and certainly ties in, ties in more specifically to, to DLA and, and DOD work. Uh, physical and cybersecurity, uh, you know, I, again, I think there's a direct tie in there. Um, you can see that there's a nice overlap from the defense and government space into physical and cybersecurity. Uh, so this is both physical, um, you know, manned security services, as well as the cyber software opportunities that you see. 
And then um, critical infrastructure, which uh, again, more of an engineering, construction, water, wastewater management services, and then maritime transport and facilities. So you kind of see the full landscape. We have a nice overlap amongst each of those four businesses. I think that you know, the way we've structured it is we're able to be very knowledgeable in each one of those businesses um, we have a lot of experience and you would come to us as experts so that we can we can help advise you more specifically in those areas as opposed to you know kind of being broad and and less of an expert in each of those spaces um, again uh, mclean group uh, nice uh, lower middle market fo focused boutique investment bank here in northern virginia you yeah, happy to kind of be there to, to answer questions and help you uh, as you're building your businesses and, and looking for ways to, to grow and, and ultimately find liquidity. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the activity, uh, the M&A activity in, in the government contracting space. You know, we've profiled uh, a few deals here at the top of the space. And you know, I, I think really our focus is talking about this holistically as contracting. You know, these these opportunities are are kind of DOD um, focused. Some some touch specifically into DLA contracts, but I, the the thesis is the same. The idea is the same um, across uh, the different agencies that these companies would work with. You know, really, what I want to say is. There's a lot of activity in the space right now. The, the the deals profiled on here have have all been in the last two weeks, um, and I think that's a sense of what's been happening in in the marketplace over the last 12, 24 months, and and what we expect and continue to happen um, specifically in, in the government space over over you have the next number of months. It's hard to go too far out. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, activity going on in the ge geopolitical world. Um, you know, there could be some positive drivers in that. There could be some negative drivers in that. But you know, you see, you see these names here, and each one of them, you know, are, are fairly significant deals. Um, you know, if we want to profile a couple of them, you know, we can look at uh, it here in the top left. Elliot um, has a buyer of. Mercury. Now, Elliot is is an activist shareholder. Mercury is a, a public company. You know, they they are probably one of the last remaining aerospace defense electronics providers. You know, so kind of specific equipment within the aerospace defense world. And you know, Elliot has an activist shareholder sees other transactions happening over the last 12 months in this space and is looking for a way to to take mercury and, and really maximize the value they're they're trying to push it to be to be sold as as a full company not just elliot coming in as a specific buyer um you know next to that uh you know mvt mvt is a is a geospatial analysis company um you know voltus is a more of a of a drone and mapping company so they're looking at a way to bring in additional um revenue uh, integration into kind of their drone uh, platforms. So the geospatial analysis allows them to provide additional data, additional detail, additional information. Uh, next to them, Daybreak. Daybreak and Azimuth, this is more of a, a merger um, than an acquisition. Uh, the companies are combining together and the management teams are kind of uh, working together uh, so not one group exiting uh, daybreak will be the company going forward more of a more of a cybersecurity intelligence uh, analytics company and azimuth is is again back into the data analytics and and geospatial analytics uh, so that you know the the combination is again you know building up an intel analysis opportunity you know the type of business you know, has a has private companies where they can they can combine together, uh, combine their resources, create some synergies amongst customers, you know, drive the revenue, and ultimately create a bigger platform where they can make more acquisitions and look at other liquidity options in the future. Uh, as opposed to kind of running through all of them, the the, the next one I want to pick up here, um, you know, kind of, kind of in the uh, in the middle is is the Firefly. Um, acquisition. So Firefly uh, is a um, 
a launch vehicle services business uh, really focused on space services and, and spacecraft. The, the acquires AE Industrial Partners. AE Industrial is a private equity firm. So, you know, the, their focus has a firm, they're looking for aerospace, defense, space, power opportunities. If Firefly obviously fits right in, but you know, the reason I want to pick that, this up is you look at the private equity world, you look at the financial buyer has an additional resource in the marketplace for potential acquisitions. It's not just, you know, strategic to strategic. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, you know, I think that really supports what, what you know, we see in the marketplace. So on, on, on the bottom left, we have, you know, the active strategic acquirers, SAIC, Castellium, Jacobs, Booz Allen, CGI, all have been very active you know, and this is looking back over, over 2021, so the last 12 months, all have been very active. Four acquisitions by SAIC, uh, three acquisitions by, by Booz Allen. Uh, you know, so that's a lot to bring into your organization, a lot to integrate and build up. But if you compare that to the financial buyers, the aggressive financial buyers out there right now, ACP, AE Industrial, Veritas Capital, Bluestone, uh, you know, a, a lot of familiar names in the government contracting space, but look at the amount of acquisitions they've done. ACP's done nine, AE Industrial's done seven, Enlightenment Capital's done six. You know, we're doubling what the strategics are doing. And they're, these companies are, are looking at businesses that have reached different milestones, have great opportunities in front of them. Some are being bought as platforms to create you know, a, a growing business. Others are being acquired and merged into other portfolio companies. You know, and these will be the next wave of, of acquisitions, you know, that may be strategic to strategic, maybe, you know, looking at bringing in another private equity firm has, has a shareholder. So, you know, you look at, at the private equity side has, you know, a, a piece that is a continued driver of the space in helping put money into a business and grow that business and build that business and, you know, come to the next level where, you know, maybe they become the next SAIC and they go public and they create this bigger platform, or maybe, you know, they are, you know, more like Daybreak and Azimuth and they merge with other businesses and continue to create a bigger platform. So a lot of activity in the space, um, you know, a lot of, of buyer interest on both the strategic and financial side. When we run processes, we try to make sure we make it as competitive as possible between you know those different those different uh, levers. Uh, you know, valuations can can differ depending on circumstances, um, but you know the competition amongst those two areas, I think, is is key when you're looking at a, a liquidity solution. So let's talk about kind of the the drivers of, of a transaction in value and what people are looking for. If we go to the next slide. So, you know, here here's kind of, you know, the main components that help contribute to the enterprise value of a business, uh, some of which you can't control, market forces. Um, you can't control what's happening in uh, the Ukraine. You can't control what's happening in the interest rate environment. You can't control what's happening in the next election cycle. Uh, so th those are things that can affect different pieces of a business and, and are aspects you need to be aware of when, when looking at an opportunity for your business and when kind of assessing the value of your business. There are pieces you can control. Um, your contract base, your core business fundamentals. So the core business fundamentals, you know, your customer mix. Do you have diversification in your customer mix or are you tied into one specific contract? Your financial profile, your size of your business. Have you built it from a million to 10 million to 50 million? I, you know, certainly as the size builds, you're going to you know, have a bigger universe of interest to buyers. And then kind of the specialization and differentiation. Uh, do you have IP in your business, intellectual property in your business that is unique to you? Do you have contract vehicles that are hard for other groups to get? You know, is your business model focused on products um, and, or services or is it selling 
software, for instance. Uh, so all of those are specific pieces you can you can control as a business owner and will help contribute to your value. All are viewed in, in different lights amongst the buyers, both from the strategic and the financial side. Next slide. So th this is a way to kind of take some of those thoughts and, and really drill down a little bit more. Uh, so these are these are are the value drivers you look for. So we've broken it out into into four different categories. First category, everybody thinks about in terms of valuation, financial performance. So revenue size, people are, are going to different valuation metrics on you based on your size. And we broke this down into kind of a strength, a neutral, and a weakness. Strength, uh, you know, 50 million plus in revenue. You've built a very sizable business. There's a lot of breadth and depth to that. You know, that's going to be viewed very favorably. Kind of that neutral area, 20 to 50 million, and, and the weakness is is sub 20 million. Now that can that can vary a little bit based on some of the other fundamentals, but generally as you look at revenue size, you know, 20 million would be the weakness. And, and what I want to say as we as we look at these is these are all kind of additive towards each other. So you're going to have a number of criteria that are strengths, you're going to have a number that are neutral and a number that are weakness. And it's that mix of all those together that helps kind of determine it, you know, the interest level of people in, uh, in the buyer universe as well as ultimately the valuation and, and what you're able to do with the transaction. So, you know, other kind of key areas to touch on, you know, uh, the business development. Are you a growing business and how fast are you growing? Uh, you know, EBITDA, this is your profitability. Are you doing strong EBITDA margins? You're north of 10% or, you know, is it pretty tight and you're, you're below 6%? So you can walk through and see see the different financial performance metrics, you know, contract and customer portfolio, another kind of key area where where groups are going to look. Uh, so are you in strategic contracts? Are you a prime? Um, you know, are you really uh, out there uh, with the full labor? Are you full labor in your in your workforce? Um, do you have less customer concentration? We talked about earlier. Those are those are strong strengths of of your business. Obviously, the converse side is going to be the weakness. Next slide. So uh, th this top group is really uh, what I would call operational performance. Uh, so these are kind of the key components inside of your business that people are going to look at: management depth, um, you know, key person, employee credentials, and, and strength of infrastructure. So management depth, you want to have a number of people in that executive team, that management team, strong background, strong ten years. You know, so you have that ability to kind of continue to grow and share in in you know that opportunity going forward the converse to that is is key person reliance if if you only have one individual you know you have what i've referred to in the past as um you know, an issue if somebody's hit by a bus you don't want your key person to to you know be in a situation where if you lose them for for one reason or another it's going to negatively affect the business oftentimes that's the founder of the business um, yeah, but is and, and can be a big risk factor in, in looking for liquidity options going forward. And then employee credentials, uh, you know, very similar. It's, you know, how many do you have that are highly cleared? How many have different uh, backgrounds? How many have the high education aspect that are really significant, specifically in services firms, but in, in, in you know, clearance level uh, situations as well? You know, and then the kind of the last driver from that perspective is the, the contract and customer portfolio. Uh, and that goes back to the proprietary technology we've talked about. You know, are you selling just a service? Or are you selling a specific product? Uh, you know, if we go back to kind of the Mercury example from, from slides earlier, Mercury is very interesting because it, it has a highly uh, differentiated uh, you know, defense electronics, there's not a lot of people out there in the market that, you know, compete with them. So they have, you know, high proprietary technology. Um, 
you know, and, and then the processes, that, you know, what are you able to do in terms of selling within the government? What certifications do you have? What clearances do you have? So all of these are key components that you have to think through in terms of, you know, what your business is, where you want your business to, to go and, and ultimately contributes into the, the value of your business, the interest level you'll receive from from other strategic buyers, the interest level you'll receive from potential financial buyers. So next slide. So I, you know, just to quick sum it up uh, before I turn it back over, I, you know, I think that uh, there's a, a lot of activity in, in the M&A landscape right now. There's uh, what we expect to be uh, demand to continue over the next number of months. You know, we've talked talked broadly about government contracting. You know, I think thematically that fits into all kind of levels of the federal government. Each one of them has a little bit of its of its own cycle, of its own curve. But we're in, you know, in a very positive place right now. And you know, hopefully we've we've outlined for you some of the things to think about and look at as you continue to, um, you know, to build your businesses and look at opportunities out there. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us today. The recording and slides will be available by close of business on Monday. Uh, here's everyone's contact information on the last slide. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week as we cover doing business with Navy Marine Corps.